This is Stephanie Huff and I'm recording another concept on sensory perception. This one is going to be about eye injuries. Just an overview. Any part of the eye can be affected by trauma with the exposed parts particularly vulnerable. Most common types of injury are going to be abrasions, lacerations, and foreign bodies. Traumatic injury um, can also be caused by penetrating objects blunt force as well as burns. And so both of these pictures at the bottom are um, pictures of subconjunctival hemorrhages um, and we'll talk about those more um, in a minute. Um, they look a lot um, worse than they actually are. Pathophysiology. <clears throat> Majority of eye injuries are preventable um, the nurses should teach um, about eye safety throughout the lifespan. Um, this is a lot of times is done during well visits and when discussing alterations in vision. Uh, pathophysiology of a given eye injury depends upon the nature of the injury itself. Looking at the etiology, eye injuries affect more than 2.5 million Americans each year with 73% um, of them being males. Almost half occur in the age range from 18 to 45. Um, common injuries in children are external injuries. Um, some of your risk factors are going to be sports. Um, this can be recreational sports, um, boxing, paintball, baseball, lacrosse, basketball, hockey, football, soccer, racquetball, um, <clears throat> other are going to be workplace injuries, fireworks, automobile accidents, and home accidents are all settings where eye injuries can occur. Adults are at greater risk. Um, these are going to be your contractors, woodworkers, welders, and electricians. Um, Sources of eye trauma in the workplace can be from chemicals, flying objects, and particles, as well as tools. Prevention. Protective eyewear prevents more than 90% of all injuries. However, 78% um, of injuries occur when um, the individual is not wearing um, eyewear at the, type of, at the time of injury. Um, the type of eyewear um, to be worn is going to be dependent on the activity. There are various eyewears um, dependent on different types of sports being played or the type of work that is done. Um, and usually um, the different types of work the employer will um, provide them with the appropriate eyewear. The ANSI's uh, Z87 um, is for home use, and so these are the ones they recommend buying glasses that have this ANSI Z87 um, documented on them. And that's what these um, two bottom pictures are, are pictures of that type of eyewear. Um, and then you also want proper UV protection, and so they do have those with um, tinted lenses for sunglasses. Um, but it is recommended... Um, to have proper UV protection to help shield the eyes from glare um, even while uh, water or snow skiing because you get that reflection that can cause some burning of the eyes. Alright, so we're going to start off with corneal abrasions. Um, eye injuries will range from mild um, injuries with no loss of vision to catastrophic injuries that have complete loss of vision in one or both eyes. So corneal abrasions um, is a disruption of the superficial epithelium of the cornea. Common objects that can cause corneal abrasions can be contact lenses, eyelashes, small foreign bodies like dust and dirt, fingernails, um, drying of the eyes, and chemical irritants can also cause corneal abrasions. Um, but there's lots of different um, causes that... Um, just even people taking clothes off a hanger um, in their closet by pulling the shirt off, which we've all done, can hit them in the eye and cause a corneal abrasion. Uh, superficial abra abrasions are very painful, but they do heal rapidly, um, usually without any complications or scarring. 
a lot of times they will complain of photophobia and tearing is usually very common. Um, a lot of times their pain is intense pain um, and they will have redness um, to their eyes as well. Um, a lot of times they sort of have this foreign body sensation in their eye. Um, and if the stroma is damaged um, by deep abrasions or lacerations, this increases the risk of infections, um, slowed healing, and scar formation. Um, the stroma is found in a couple of different places of the eye. Uh, one place it can be interlaced. Um, it's an interlacement of fibers. Um, some circle the circumference of the iris and the majority radiate um, toward the pupil. They are also found in the cornea, which is a fibrous, tough, um, transparent um, membrane. A lot of your superficial corneal abrasions are usually diagnosed um, by um, touching a sterile fluorescein strip to the lower conjunctiva and the dye remains where the corneal epithelial cells are disrupted and so basically you just kind of numb their eye with tetracaine, stain it, look at it under a black light and the abrasion will absorb the stain and so this is a picture of a corneal abrasion. And we'll talk about treatments and stuff for all of these as we um, get on to implementation. But basically, um, antibiotic eye drops. Um, anytime you have any kind of eye injury, you always want to um, make sure that their tetanus immunization is up to date as well. All right, burns. Um, the outer surface of the eye is subjected to burns by heat, radiation, and explosion. But chemical burns are going to be your most common um, type of burn to the eye. Uh, patients that um, with burns to the eye, you will usually give you a history of face and eye contact with um, a caustic substance. Both of your alkaline and acid substances can burn the eye. Ammonia um, products containing lye like your oven and drain cleaners. Um, acids could be from car batteries. Alkalines are usually more serious because tiny particles remain embedded in the conjunctival sac, causing progressive damage. Acids um, cause a rapid damage, but usually are less serious um, burns than the alkaline um, burns are. Your explosions and flash burn injuries are at greatest risk for thermal burns. Uh, UV rays um, cause mild to extensive corneal damage. A lot of times they will complain of eye pain, decreased vision or um, blindness. They may have swollen eyelids, uh, red edematous conjunctiva. They can have um, cloudy or hazy conjunctiva as well. Um, there is a possibility that some ulcerations may be present. And so um, one of the main things is irrigating the eyes for chemical burns. Um, and it's usually used with normal saline. Um, a lot of times they will dilate uh, the pupils to reduce pain and prevent um, adhesions. A lot of times, sometimes they'll patch the eye after it's irrigated, um, but topical um, anesthetic is applied before irrigation um, process is started. So these are some different um, chemical burns or types of burns to the eye. The top left is a thermal burn injury. On the top right, that is an alkali burn. On the bottom left, that is a chemical injury. And on the bottom right is an ocular burn. And so you can see how they can greatly affect the eye as well as vision. All right, so penetrating trauma. Um, you can have metal flakes and particles that are produced by high-speed drilling or grinding. Um, glass shards or other things um, can also penetrate the eye. You can have bullets, um, even BBs, arrows, knives. As you can see in some of these pictures, we've got fish hooks and nails. 
um, that had penetrated the eye. Um, but there are, as you see, a variety of um, causes. In a penetrating injury, the layers of the eye spontaneously reapproximate after entry of the sharp object into the globe. Um, like most of the time, the penetrating eye injuries have a single entrance wound from the injury. There may be multiple wounds, but they have been caused by multiple sources. And these injuries may not be readily apparent when the eye is inspected if they have gone all the way into the eye and they're not sticking out. Some of your um, penetrating injuries may be missed when the patient has other significant injuries that need attention. Um, like when the eyelid is lacerated or has a puncture wound, it's important to make sure that you check the eye for possible damage to it as well. In a perforating injury, the layers don't spontaneously reapproximate. This results in global rupture or potential loss of ocular contents. Usually they will have an entrance and an exit wound and they're both from the same source. Your eye perforations can cause pain, partial or complete vision loss, and possible bleeding or extrusion of eye contents. <clears throat> so basically if you have a foreign object that's embedded um, in or sticking out of the eye, it's important not to remove it and immobilize the object and protect it until um, either the physician or the ophthalmologist arrives and just manage their pain. Some of your minor um, things can be um, minor foreign bodies. You may can irrigate them out. Um, sometimes you can use a sterile moistened um, cotton tipped applicator um, or sometimes you actually have to use a sterile needle like a 27 gauge and, and sometimes it's embedded in the cornea and you just kind of have to pick it out um, but always make sure that you're anesthetizing the eye before you start doing any of that um, but then you've basically just created a corneal abrasion and then you just treat it like a corneal abrasion so antibiotic ointments um, or eye drops are used. Sometimes they do eye drops depending on the type of injury. Like some of these will probably have to go to surgery to have them removed. Here's some other types of foreign bodies to the eye. Um, and so that one kid has an arrow stuck in his eye and then you can see this guy's got a knife in his eye or it's actually looks like maybe right below it. Um, got another fish hook and then you can see that little speck on the bottom left, and that's just a um, embedded foreign body in the uh, cornea. So moving on to blunt trauma. Um, sports injuries are common, um, so they could be struck with a ball like baseball, tennis balls, racquetballs, handballs. Um, during contact sports, like football, basketball, boxing, and wrestling, they have the potential to have blunt trauma to their eye. Other causes could be uh, motor vehicle collisions, falls, and physical assaults. Um, blunt trauma can lead to um, minor injury, and that is like lid ecchymosis or black eye, and there's a picture of one up here. Um, subconjunctival hemorrhages, which we talked about. Um, other things that can cause those subconjunctival hemorrhages could be coughing, increased physical exercise, mild trauma. Um, I've often seen it with people that have had um, excess vomiting or even straining. Um, and basically you've just popped a um, ruptured a blood vessel in the conjunctival and it causes that bleeding into that um, white surface of the sclera of the eye. Um, there's usually no pain or discomfort. Sometimes they may say it just feels a little weird, especially if there's a lot of blood there. Um, no treatment is needed and usually the blood will be reabsorbed by the body in about two to three weeks. Um, your hyphema 
is um, they will complain of eye pain, decreased visual acuity, and seeing a reddish tint. And so basically that is where they have bleeding into the anterior, anterior chamber of the eye. And so on the bottom right, you can see that um, blood fluid level in the eye. For your orbital blowout fractures, they can complain of diplopia, which is double vision, pain with upward movement of the eye, um, is affected, and they may also have a decreased sensation of the affected cheek. They may also have an ophthalmus, which is an eye that appears like it's sunken in. Um, any part of the eye orbit may be fractured, but the ethmoid bone on the orbital floor is the most likely site to be fractured. The orbital contents, including fat, muscles, and eye itself, may herniate through the fracture into the underlying maxillary sinus. But a lot of times on your blowout fractures, they may look very similar to um, a black eye, um, but they may be more swollen or more tender, um, but you just need to get um, some x-rays or a CT in order to um, better diagnose and find out exactly where the fracture is. All right, looking at detached retina. So normally the vitreous humor um, adheres to the retina at the optic disc, macula, and the periphery of the eye. With aging, the vitreous humor shrinks and may pull the retina away from the um, cochroid and that can cause a detached retina. And so basically what happens is that there's a separation of the retina from the um, choroid and that's what causes it. And so there's a picture of it right there and sometimes you'll have a retinal tear with it. Um, it can be precipitated by trauma um, but a lot of times it just occurs spontaneously. And then like we talked about it can occur as an aging process. Some of your risk factors, um, in addition to um, the aging process, are going to be myopia, which is nearsightedness, glaucoma, trauma, previous retinal detachment, aphakia, which is absence of the lens, um, and that could be following um, a lens removal from cataracts. The um, retina may actually tear and fold back on itself, or it may remain intact, but is no longer adheres to the um, choroid. Um, so this tear will then allow fluid to enter the defect, and the detached retina can rapidly increase in size, thus increasing the loss of vision. Unless contact between the retina and the choroid is reestablished, then the neurons of the retina become ischemic and die, and this will cause a permanent vision loss. So uh, retinal detachment is a true medical emergency that requires prompt ophthalmolic, ophthalmologic treatment. A lot of times they will complain of floaters or spots and lines or flashes of light um, in the visual field. Um, they may have a sensation of a curtain being drawn across their visual field. Um, most of the time there is no pain, which if somebody comes in and they have loss of vision without pain, then you should suspect detached retina. And this is when you want to notify the physician um, immediately so that treatment can be started promptly to try to save their vision. Um, so here is basically um, somebody that has clear vision versus somebody that has retinal detachment or retinal tears and you can see the floaters and you can see how in the periphery they don't have as um, good of a vision. 
And so depending on which area of the retina has detached will depend on where their vision is affected. All right, when you're looking at collaboration, your diagnostic test and medical and nursing interventions will vary based on the extent of the injury. The nurse needs to reinforce importance of protective eyewear, especially in occurrence of minor injuries so that hopefully you can prevent major ones from happening in the future. Diagnostic tests that are done, um, usually they begin with um, tests for visual acuity. You want to eval evaluate their extraocular movements, assess pupil reactivity and size. Um, an ophthalmoscope is used to examine the fundus and check for the red reflex. Um, a slit lamp is basically a high intensity light source that's combined with low power microscope and I showed you a picture of that when we were talking about um, the concept of um, sensory perception and there was a picture of that we talked about. Um, slit lamps are often used in conjunction with fluorescein stain which is an orangey uh, yellow in color um, when it applies, it does fill the de defect on the cornea, which we talked about with corneal abrasions. Um, same thing with corneal ulcerations. Um, and so this will uh, fluoresce under cobalt blue light of the slit lamp. Um, you can also use a black light um, to do the same thing. And that's used to identify that corneal injury. Um, and sometimes they can use it for um, diagnosing retinal detachment. All right, surgeries. Um, usually it is unnecessary um, in the treatment of corneal abrasions, of conjunctival hemorrhages, and periorbital ecchymosis. Um, for injuries from severe chemical burns, surgery may include debridement, tissue grafting, or corneal transplant. Your penetrating wounds generally need surgical intervention by an ophthalmolo ophthalmologic, ophthalmologic surgeon. Blunt trauma uh, surgery depends on the extent and type of injury, um, corneal abrasion, global rupture, retinal detachment, or lens dislocation. Your um, conjunctival foreign bodies usually don't need surgery. Um, usually the removal is done in the emergency department setting. Retinal detachment is a medical emergency and they can either use a cryotherapy um, which is using a supercooled probed or a laser um, photocoagulation um, that can be used to create an area of inflammation and adhesion uh, and basically they use it to kind of weld the layers back together. Um, scleral bu buckling is an indentation or fold um, is surgically created in the sclera to restore contact between the um, choroid and the retina and contact is maintained with a local um, implant on the sclera or sometimes it is a, an encirculating strap or a buckle and that just kind of holds that pressure there while it heals. A pneumonatic red Retinopexy is air injected into the vitreous, vitreous cavity and the position is placed in so that the air bubble pushes the detached portion of the retina in contact with the um, choroid and that way it just stays in that place until it um, reattaches itself back. Your pharmacologic therapy um, for treatment of your corneal abrasions and following removal of conjunctival foreign bodies. Um, a lot of times they will use irrigation, um, sterile cotton swabs or needles to get those foreign bodies off um, and they are followed by antibiotic ointments. Um, a lot of times they may use erythromycin or a um, sulfacetamide sodium ophthalmic um, medication your treatment of burns, um, pain medications can be oral or eye drops. 
Steroids are given to decrease inflammation. Psychoplegic drops um, such as atropine, tropicamide, psychopentolate um, are used to dilate the pupil um, in order to help decrease pain. After irrigation is done, um, topical antibiotics are used. A lot of times they may use like a genomycin ophthalmic. Um, for your penetrating or perforating injuries, pain control with narcotics like morphine. Um, they may need sedation with diazepam. Um, Antiemetics are given to prevent vomiting because that causes more pressure and can actually dislodge um, some of those foreign bodies, especially the ones that are sticking out. Um, antibiotics like cefalzolin, which is ANSEF, genomycin or garamycin, um, is used to prevent infections. Your blunt trauma may require um, a reduction of intraocular pressure with a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor like Dimox or Daranide. After surgery for retinal detachment, a lot of times steroids are used to decrease inflammation. And there is a box on 1315 that has medications um, and it talks about the mechanism of injury and nursing considerations. Additional therapies. I already talked about using anesthetizing eye drops um, like tetracaine in order to um, numb the eye so you can get a better um, assessment of the eye. For corneal abrasions and large foreign bodies, um, they may use um, an eye patch after an antibiotic um, ointment or drops are applied, um, and they will keep it on for 24 hours. Um, a lot of places don't do eye patching anymore, and that's just because if you um, patch the eye and leave it on for 24 hours, you can't put any more antibiotic ointment in there. Um, and so a lot of places don't patch and they just allow the patient to um, continuously apply the antibiotic cream, I mean ointment or eye drops in because it's usually done every few hours. Um, your foreign body on the conjunctiva, um, you can try to irrigate, move, remove it with irrigation or a sterile cotton tip um, applicator like a Q-tip can be used. Sometimes that doesn't work, and so they may need to use like a needle, which is usually like a 27-gauge needle, so it's really small, and you just kind of pick it out. Um, sometimes it will, if it's a piece of metal, it may may leave like what they call a rust ring, and an eye burr is used, and it's kind of like a really small kind of um, drill-looking thing, um, but it has like a, a tip on it that basically it just... Um, takes away the first couple of layers of the cornea in order to get rid of that rust ring and then you just treat them with as if they had a corneal abrasion. Like I said, don't forget to make sure that their tetanus immunizations are up to date with any eye injuries. Alright, looking at chemical burns, first you want to make sure that you remove any clothing that may still contain the chemical because you don't want to re-expose. Um, the immediate care includes flushing um, the affected eye um, or both eyes with copious amounts of fluid. Normal saline is preferred, um, but if it's not available, um, you want to use water. So a lot of times they'll try to flush it out immediately at the scene, um, and they recommend them to irrigate it at least 30 minutes. A Morgan lens um, unit is used, and these are all pictures of the Morgan lens, and it just kind of goes in the eye, um, kind of like a contact. Um, but again, you need to make sure that you are ear, um, numbing the eye before you do this. The eyelid is um, everted, and that's to identify and remove material from the conjunctival sac if it's there. Um, again, that topical anesthetic, tetracaine. Uh, during irrigation, the fluid will be directed from the inner to the outer canthus of the eye. You also want to tilt the head so that um, if the other eye is not affected, that the chemicals aren't running into the other eye, so you want them to run away from the unaffected eye. Usually irrigation is continued until the pH of the eye is normal, which is 7.2 to 7.4. And then after irrigation, antibiotics are applied, like genomycin ophthalmic. 
All right, and so this is pictures of the whole process of doing the Morgan lens. And so at first, they are putting in an um, ocular anesthetic. Then they're attaching the Morgan lens, and it just attaches to a regular IV tubing. And then you see that they lift the upper lid, and they slide it in on the upper lid, and then slide it down on the, on the lower lid. Then the patient has to close their eye, and that's what keeps it in their eye. Um, and then when you removal, you want to get it out from the lower lid first, and then remove it from the upper lid. But you can use just a regular bag of um, normal saline like you would to give an IV and run it through this same line. Alright, so looking at penetrating and perforating injuries, um, you don't want to remove the object until um, either the physician or an ophthalmologist, ophthalmologist I'll get out here in a second, um, can see the client and depending on the type um, will depend on um, who you need to call. But a lot of times they are seen by um, emergency department physician first and then they will consult the um, ophthalmologist and let them know kind of what is going on. Um, immediate care is going to be focused on relieving the pain and protecting the eye from further injury. Um, surgical intervention may be needed and so you want your ophthalmic surgeon to do that. Uh, you want to gently cover the eye with a sterile gauze or an eye pad to prevent loss of intraocular contents. Um, if the object is embedded or sticking out and the and a gauze or it's too big for an eye shield, then they will immobilize the object with a paper cup. Sometimes they will um, patch the unaffected eye just to keep them from moving their eyes much. Um, and that helps decrease the risk of trauma for the eye that has the injury to it. In blunt trauma, you want to put the client on bed rest in a semi fowler's position. And that helps with swelling. You want to protect the eye from uh, further injury. Sometimes they'll use the eye shield for that, just depending on what type of trauma is going on. For your detached retina, um, like again, it is a medical emergency. Um, not treating um, this leads to permanent blindness in that detached portion. If, the, if an ophthalmologist is unavailable, you want to position the head so gravity pulls the retina closer to the um, choroid. And so if it's in the back part, then they should lay um, flat with the head midline. Your cryotherapy, laser photocoagulation, that scleral buckling, and the pneumatic retinop retinopexy, um, those are the ones that we just discussed um, in the previous um, slides. All right, looking at the nursing process, education for prevention of eye injuries. You also want to provide direct care to clients with eye injuries. When you're looking at assessment, um, immediate intervention um, is done simultaneously with assessment and history. You want to determine the type, time, and extent of the injury, the circumstances around which the injury occurred, um, do they have any pre-existing visual problems. Looking at the physical assessment, you want to do a good vision assessment, um, with, and that's looking at their acuity, and you want to use corrective lenses if they wear corrective lenses. Um, Eye movement needs to be assessed unless it's a penetrating object present. Prior to any inspection, you want to make sure that they have a topical anesthetic. That helps decrease their eye pain and the photophobia, and so it's easier for them to open their eye for a good exam. And so um, you want to look at their lid and eye for any lacerations or foreign objects noted. Um, you want to use a strong light and magnification device so you can get better visualization. Early manifestations of retinal detachment need to be identified so that treatment can be initiated quickly. These are your NANDA diagnosis.
All right, so goals can be that the client will be free of pain associated with the injury. They will be able to articulate um, and follow directions regarding eye protection and healing process. They need to be able to describe when to call the primary care physician for worsening symptoms or condition. Um, they will experience healing and restoration of vis vision to the maximum level um, extent that is possible. All right, so reducing risk for impaired vision. You want to assess the vision in each eye with and without correction. This is done at the entry to the emergency department or the um, primary care physician. Um, this will give um, the effects of the injury on their vision. It also gives a baseline for comparison for later um, visual assessments. You want to inspect the eyes for foreign bodies, burns, penetrating or blunt trauma, any lacerations present. Uh, blepharism is um, a term that is um, looking at spasms that cause the eye to blink continuously. Um, that, as well as eye pain, can prevent a good assessment of the eye that is injured. Um, and so these are the ones that may benefit greatly from those anesthetizing eye drops. Um, your irrigation is a high priority for your chemical exposures. You want to remove any loose foreign bodies with moist, sterile, cotton-tipped applicators. For um, severe or penetrating injuries, you want to promote rest, stabilize the injured eye to prevent uh, to preserve their vision. You want to apply eye drops and ointment as prescribed. Um, apply iPad or shield if ordered. Sometimes that will help reduce pain and photophobia. All right, so interventions for retinal detachment. Um, notifying the physician or the ophthalmologist immediately and that will um, help to preserve their vision and initiate treatment. You want to position the client so the detachment is inferior. So basically what area, whatever area of the eye is affected with the vision, you want to place them in that position so that um, the pressure is on the detached area. So sometimes it may be in a prone position with their head turned to the side or laying in a supine position. You want to maintain calm and confident attitude. Um, that keeps the patient less stressed. Reassure the client that most retinal detachments um, are successfully treated, usually on an outpatient basis. Um, explaining all procedures fully will help facilitate understanding and helps to relieve their anxiety. Um, allow supportive family members to remain. That also helps lower their anxiety level. I've, but then always if you have a family member that's not real supportive or um, maybe very high strung and stressing them out, you don't want them at the bedside. All right, other things for retinal detachment, discussing preparations for home care, um, limitations on positioning the head um, before and after repair, uh, activity restrictions, usually no bending, no straining um, at stool, use of an eye shield, um, they need to know about early manifestations and the importance of immediate care and follow-up treatment with an ophthalmologist, evaluation, um, expected outcomes will include that they will maintain optimal vision following injury. They will experience no loss of vision as a result of preventable complications. And they will report pain management to acceptable levels. And so this is the end of the eye injuries. And as always, if you have questions, please let me know and I will try to clarify.